Have I already filmed this video uh, once today and then hated it? Yeah, yeah, I have. Um, yeah, uh, I literally got to edit today and then I decided I hated hated it. So we're refilming it. Um, oh, it probably won't go up today. But you know what? It's what it is. It is the 31st of December as I'm filming this, uh, which means it's the last day of the year, 2021. Glad to see you go. Um, and so I've decided is is tradition by tradition i mean i did this last year i'm going to film my favorite books of 2021 video i have got some fiction books that i love this year and some non-fiction books that i love this year to talk about to rave about to gush about um yeah this year i also thought i would talk about some of my reading stats from the year because i've tried to be a bit more organized this year last year i talked about how um i really hadn't been organized in terms of like sitting down to this video i've tried to be a smidge a smidgen more organized this year and so here we are let's talk about some of my stats for the year as well as my favorite books of the year and let's start with the fun stuff the numbers which is what everyone cares about. I, I know that's why you're here. So at the beginning of this year, January 2021, I set myself some targets. I said that I was going to t attempt to read 25 books and 15,000 pages. This is mainly because 2020, I only got back into reading um, properly then. And I didn't really read that many books. And so I didn't want to set myself like this, like a huge, unachievable target for the year. Um, and then fail because I hate failure. And so I thought I'd set myself something manageable, something bite size, and we can keep increasing. I actually ended up reading 88 books this year, which, what? I read 88 books this year, as well as 32,222 pages, which I think is insane. Pat on the back to me. I really didn't think it was gonna be anywhere near there. I kind of, yeah, which is wild. In terms of the types of books I read in the moods, I read mostly emotional, lighthearted and funny books. This is mainly because my depression had me on a chokehold this year by the literal neck. Um, but you know what? It is what it is. And so basically this year I just read a lot of very like lighthearted romance reads. Um, I think that's probably why I read so many books, 88 books, is that I find romance reads really easy to read. And when I was deep in the feels, like deep in I have not left the bed in a few days, to make myself feel productive, what I would do is I would read an entire book. I don't know if it's healthy, but it's coping. So don't chat to me about it. Um, uh, the least kind of books I read were like tense, sad, relaxing, mysterious and adventurous, which I think makes sense. Um, in terms of the pacing of my books, I, most of my books were medium paced. So 48% of my books were medium paced. 29% of my books were actually slow paced. I think the primary reason for this is I read a lot of Mariana Zapata's work this year and the woman loves a slow burn. Like she loves a slow burn. So that's probably it. And then 23% were fast. Uh, in terms of page number, 77% um, of my books were between 300 and 499 pages long. 15% uh, were under 300 pages. I think that was a lot of my nonfiction reads for the year. And then 7% uh, were 500 pages and more. Um, in terms of my fiction to non-fiction split, this is embarrassing. Uh, I am embarrassed. Um, so basically this year I read 91% fiction and 9% non-fiction. That is terrible for me. It's usually about a 60-40 split. So I am a little bit ashamed. Like I am a little bit ashamed of that one. But next year, when I am less depressed, we will read more non-fiction because non-fiction has a tendency to be a little bit depressing. I'm, I'm gonna put it out there. And we were just, we were not about that this year. Um, in terms of genre, it was mostly romance and contemporary, exceedingly romance and contemporary, like my literary fiction, but so small this year. Um, but yeah, we'll do better next year. The lip fit co in me will come out next year, I promise. Uh, and then format, I read most of my books digitally th this year. 74% of them were digital, 26 of them were print. However, I've been getting into print books a lot more recently so i'm really excited to continue buying print books and reading print books in terms of most read authors like i said i read a lot of mariana zapata's work this year she was my most read author i read eight of her books this year uh, i read quite a bit of jasmine guillory um and then third next were talia hibbert tessa bailey and chloe lease uh, all of which are romance authors shock horror surprise who is surprised not me um 
so yeah uh and then finally my star rating apparently there are some books i've not given star ratings to so i'll have to go through those this in the next few days and give those star ratings but of the ones that i've given star ratings to my average is about 3.41 which makes sense to me because i do give a lot of my romance reads about 3.5 stars three stars so uh, yeah 3.41 makes a lot of sense to me yeah those are my stats this year um i don't know <laughs> Okay, so yeah, those are my stats from this year. Uh, now let's get on to the nitty gritty, the creme de la creme. The reason why you are here, let's talk about my favourite books from this year. Okay, so like I said, I've got nine books to talk about. I've got four non-fiction books to talk about and five fiction books to talk about. And we're going to go, we're going to roll with it and we're going to start with the non-fiction and get those out of the way with and done. Okay, so the first book we're going to talk about is What White People Can Do Next by Emma DeBerry. I really love Emma DeBerry. I've listened to some of her work before. And so when I saw that she was releasing this book, I knew that I absolutely had had to get it and read it. And I'm so glad that I did. Uh, Emma DeBerry in this work wades into the anti-racist um, handbook industrial complex in this short but surprisingly radical text. In this... Um, she basically offers a contrast to other anti-racist literature. I think a lot of anti-racist literature that is like aimed at well-meaning white people um, is very individualistic and talks about how they themselves can change, microaggressions, and doing their own privilege, all those kind of individual things. But what Deberry pushes us to do is to move away from this very neoliberal um, idea of um, inclusivity and join together in truly coalitional politics um, that actually could change the world. Um, I think what I really enjoyed about this book is she offers uh, quite a lot of very sharp, short, succinct lessons that are fleshed out in um, almost like short bite-sized chapters. Um, things like interrogating whiteness, interrogating capitalism, uh, denouncing um, white saviorism and like white guilt and through which she expands upon these very important aspects of allyship and coalition, challenges us to do better um, and makes an argument towards an anti-capitalist and ecological centric form of um, living that ends whiteness as a system and actually moves us forward into the future. This book is a fundamental reading, I think, to anybody who is wanting to move their allyship forward um, and all about collective action. So 100% recommend it. So the next book that we're going to talk about is A Decolonial Feminism by Francois Vergès. Vergès? It is translated from the French, which I think the French is like un feminique decolonial or un decolonially feminique. Can you tell that I barely scraped through GCSE French? Because I can. I think what is brilliant about this book is that it is academic but accessible without compromising on the complexity of the argument. This book is, I think, the femin the feminist, <laughs> the manifesto for intersectional feminism. While the phrase intersectional feminism actually isn't mentioned once in the book, it basically seeks to reclaim the feminist movement, moving us away from that neoliberal white feminism that she dubs civilization feminism that aims to recreate structures from the global north and the global south without any consideration for them, their culture, practices, etc. I think this book is fundamental reading for anybody who um, wants to expand their feminism, wants to become an intersectional feminism. Uh, you know what they say, your feminism will be intersectional or it will be bullshit. And so if you want your feminism to be less bullshit, that wasn't English, if you want your feminism to be less bullshit, then I absolutely recommend picking this book up. I'm actually using it for my dissertation, my master's dissertation. So that's how good this book is. Okay, so I'm noting a trend with my non-fiction books, which is short, snappy, succinct. <laughs> it is what it is. And the next book is no different. Uh, and that is uh, One of Them by Musa Okonga. Can I take any credit whatsoever for finding this book? Zero. Zero credit. I was a sheep. A sheeple. I was influenced by Hannah from Hannah May, who I love and adore. We all know that I'm such a fangirl for that girl. Um, so she talked about this book so much that I, I had to pick it up. I, I, I couldn't not pick it up. And I'm so glad that I did. Musa Okonga in one of them, I don't know why I said it that way, but one of them is a coming of age memoir um, that chronicles um, Musa Okonga's life as a black young man from an immigrant family who has dreams of going to Eton, which he does do. If you don't know, Eton is kind of like the most prestigious, like all male school prep school in the UK, um, maybe in the world, I don't know. Um, but it produces prime ministers, royal family go there, like anyone who's anyone in like upper class British society and is a man, specifically white men, 
they kind of all go to Eton. Eton and Harry, but this one's specifically about Eton. Um, what I love and I think is the gem of this book is that it manages to weave so seamlessly uh, the like true coming of age memoir of Moose's life with um, very insightful um, explorations of British society, British culture, especially upper class British society. It becomes a commentary on racism, on classism, on um, what access into those spaces gets you. And I think that is literally fantastic. Um, the book is more of a series of vignettes rather than chapters. It's not like a chronological detailing in like memoir form, as you might come to expect, but it describes all aspects of Okongwa's life before, during and after Eton. It honestly is not a hyperbole to say that this is one of the most phenomenal non-fiction books I've ever read in my entire life. Uh, Okongwa is a superb, amazing writer. Every sentence is crafted with such intention, making for prose that is both restrained and revelatory. It is disarming in its honesty um, and one of them tells the story of a black bisexual working class man that becomes uh, middle class, uh, you know, as, as you will do after Eton and at Oxbridge. Um, but it becomes almost like, it becomes an exploration of a struggle with identity. It is honestly one of the most amazing books I've ever read and I would 100% recommend it to you because Okwonga manages to really capture the multiple faces of British racism from behind your back, Etonian racism, all the way up until uh, the National Front. Um, and he managed to do this and like just so intricately link it with um, how the system is built and rigged for um, Eton graduates, especially white upper class Eton graduates. I've rambled on about that book, but I just, I really loved it. Please read it. Okay, so the last book that we've absolutely got to talk about in this non-fiction section, that's what it's called, uh, is Lost in Work by uh, Amelia Horgan. This book comes from the same series uh, that Feminism Interrupted came from, which was in my favourites of last year. So Lost in Work is a concise and highly accessible history. Uh, look at the history of work, the current situation and how we might escape what capitalism has told us is the only way to live. Horgan explores what work is, how it has a history of harm and what we might push for in order to make work much, le much less damaging than it currently is. It's broken down into nine chapters almost essays um in which Horgan um explores various themes from what work does to us as individuals to the jobification of daily life it is a well-targeted piece of political theory which employs everyday examples anecdotal evidence and a patient methodical style entering into a dialogue with the people who do the kind of labor that the text is writing about the book basically asks us to examine both our individual and collective relationship with the work that we do to what extent does it control us and immiserate us and uh, to what extent is it our only access to both personal self-respect and a me and to what extent is it a means of survival this book raises questions pertinent ones um and honestly i would really recommend it if you are um looking for an easy access into anti-capitalist literature um and i don't know like planning for what the future could look like in a hopeful utopia really recommend this book okay so let's talk about <laughs> let's do my let's do the fiction books now that we're done with the non-fiction and I actually could not not start this section. Couldn't not start this section with Memorial by Brian Washington. This is a moving and intimate portrait of a relationship on the precipice of failure. When Mike discovers that his estranged father in Japan is dying just as his mother is arriving in Houston to visit, he leaves her with his leave-in boy with his live-in boyfriend, Benson. Um and though the two have never met, Benson and Mike's mother basically start to share this one bedroom house um, as well as kind of like living together and developing patterns um, around their days together. Meanwhile, Mike is in Japan looking after his um, sick father, developing his own routine and kind of dealing with uh, the childhood abandonment of his dad that he has quite clearly never dealt with. Um, and with this debut novel, uh, Washington illustrates a hilarious yet heartbreaking portrait of two gay men of colour trying to salvage the bones of their dysfunctional relationship and their affection for each other. This book 
crept up on me in the first third or so i was i was enjoying it i was there but i wasn't really sure exactly where it was heading or what i was going to feel about it and by the end having finished that i still don't know if i adequately have the words to explain exactly why i love this book as much as i did but i think the best i can do is that it looks at the insides of two people's lives, struggling to move forward, uh, being pulled by their past and learning to overcome their own issues in order to help each other. Though it's not neat and tidy, I think life rarely is and Washington manages to capture that in this book in a way that just felt so real. Ah, oh, I get emotional thinking about this book. I just absolutely adored it. My next favourite fiction book that we've absolutely got to talk about is Transcendent Kingdom by Yaa Gyasi. Around a year ago, around the same time, this exact same space, I sat here and talked about how Homegoing by Yaa Gyasi was one of my favourite books of 2020 and how I was very excited to read Transcendent Kingdom in 2021 and I was highly anticipated and boy did it not disappoint! So, um, Transcendent Kingdom is a beautiful and moving look at grief, faith, family and science. It follows Gifty who is studying for a PhD in neuroscience at Stanford and her research deals with depression and um, addiction, two things that she is um, well aware of. Um, so her older brother, Nana, who was a gifted, gifted basketball player, um, basically dies of an overdose from Oxy and her mother has been virtually bedridden with grief, with grief, with grief and depression ever since the death. And so, while Gifty hopes to find a scientific explanation for the issues that have affected her family and so many others, I don't think she truly understands the toll that they've taken on her until her mother comes to stay with her for a little while. And so, she is struggling to look after her mother. She's struggling to complete her work, and she basically starts reminiscing about back in the day. Uh, of attending church with her mother the evangelical church she grew up with the abandonment of their her abandonment because of the, her father all those kinds of things and this book is gorgeously written it's a story of racism and the immigrant experience the pain of addiction depression and loss and the clarifying power for some of faith and science i felt the emotions of this book uh, almost snuck up on me the way they did on gifty it felt like her and i were both on the same journey as the story developed and I think that is an amazing thing to be able to do. Transcendent Kingdom is an intimate portrayal of the immigrant experience as well as the opioid abuse uh, crisis. Yag Yasi has found a way uh, to really make sure that her voice is heard and was in full command of the work the entire time. The pacing is perfect, the structure is brilliant with past and present so seamlessly woven together. I don't think I've got another word to describe the experience of this book besides transcendent. The third non-fiction book that I absolutely loved that we have to talk about is Seven Days in June by Tia Williams. This is a second chance love story romance that manages to capture within its pages an entire spectrum of black spirit, joy, humour and redemption. Eva Mercy is a single mum to a very precocious 12 year old named Audrey, like icon. We stand an icon living. Uh, I should also mention that this book has um, chronic illness representation as Eva Mercy. Um, struggles with things like blackouts and fatigue. At a literary event in New York, New York City, she runs into award-winning author Shane Hall, who typically keeps a bit of a low profile. Uh, and so while they initially try to pretend to not know each other, their chemistry is obviously, it's, it's clear, it's, it's evident, and rumors start swirling. And so the book basically follows Shane and Evo, uh, who are together for the next week, well, Shane is in town for seven days in June uh, and they spend time together trying to reconnect uh, but Eva has her guard up considering their past and so the story basically alternates between those seven days in June that week the current week that they're living and their time together 15 years ago. This book was so unapologetically black. The love felt authentic and real and it's probably my favourite romance book that I've ever read. And take it from a girl who read a lot of romance books this year, that is a pretty high accolade. I will say that I definitely think that uh, if you're going to read this book, it is not just like a fluffy romance, if that makes sense. Um, it definitely straddles that straddles that line I think between like literific and romance and therefore it does deal and grapple with some issues and I would definitely recommend reading the trigger warnings before you start reading this book. Okay so like I said I read a lot of romance this year and while Seven Days in June is a romance read I don't think it it adequately captures the type of romance that I was truly in my feels in my depressive bed reading but do you want to know what does? 
it happened one summer by Tessa Bailey. I know that romance is not for everybody. I'm looking at literally all of my lip thick friends who don't like romance. But you know what I will say? The girls that get it, get it. And the girls that don't... Well... <laughs> it Happened One Summer is by Tessa Bailey. And I have read a lot of Tessa Bailey's books before. And whilst I've never really disliked a book she's written, I'd never really fallen in love with a book. The way that I fell in love with It Happened One Summer. Uh, okay, so the book basically follows Piper, who is, um, think... Paris Hilton-y, internet sensation-y, like, influencer type situation person. Going through yet another breakup, she basically keeps having these, like, hard and fast flings with these, like, Hollywood playboy heartbreakers. And she almost, like, she's so generic that you can't separate the plastic um, public persona that she's built from who she is now. And she can't either, which is... I mean, tenant of the book. And while she is an internet sensation with like all these people around her, she doesn't really think she's got anybody in her life that she can really trust besides her sister, Hannah. And after landing herself in jail after a wild night, her stepfather basically sentences her to go back to her hometown to, re to reconnect with her roots. Her dad was a crab fisherman uh, from Westport, Washington. I think really tiny, quaint town in Westport, Washington. And she basically has to go back there, run her father's bar. She's kind of cut off and... She's got to work now. The ghetto, I know, right? <laughs> it happened once summer truly triumphs because it manages to deliver a story that is equal parts like rom-com, steamy, contemporary, and earnest small town romance. All the characters are so lovable and have a multitude of layers. Piper easily shares that socialite persona and becomes a very endearing protagonist dead set on uh dead set and charming the residents of the town of westport and honoring her late father's memory brendan the love interest he's your classic kind of grump to piper sunshine yes okay the trope works if it works it works but yeah he is kind of this grump to piper sunshine but he is willing to listen learn and observe he compliments her and is willing to understand that change can be a very good thing and westport itself oh adorable it's such a cute little town and all the characters have a shine on their own. I will say this is definitely a very much like a romancy chick litty book. So if you're not into that kind of thing, you probably won't love this book. However, if you are into that kind of romance, do it to yourself. Do it. Honestly, do it. We are at the last book. The last one. Woo, woo. Mm -mm -mm. Well, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop embarrassing myself now. We're gonna actually just chat about this book because like, what are you doing, girly? The last book that we're gonna talk about is We Are All Birds of Uganda by Hassa Zayan. This is a marriage between history and the present of reconciliation of the old and newfound identities, amalgamation of strands and struggles of the Ugandan Asian diaspora, sweeping, sweeping, seeping through generations. This is a debut novel from Zayan and it is a narrative of two halves. Um, it's a beautifully told story that follows Samir, a 20-something British lawyer whose family were amongst those expelled from Uganda under the rule of Idi Amin. And the story, the story moves between Samir's story in present day and also that of his grandfather Hassan, whose story is told through a series of letters written to his late wife. The switch between time periods serves to unravel and explore the complexities of generational divides, racial tensions and the long legacy of the destructive nature of the British colonial empire. There is absolutely no denying the beauty of this book from the absolutely stunning cover, st stunning cover, to the exquisite prose and vivid imagery that really bring the story to life. The author explores topics such as race, gender, privilege and oppression, even addressing the rights of open and accepted racism in today's British society. But Ultimately, what is at the heart of the story is that it is a search for one's identity to learn who you are in your heart and soul. I think I particularly enjoyed Samir's journey of discovery as a young man torn between two cultures, which I think if you are growing up as part of the diaspora, you can probably relate to. Um, and you can tell this is so evident because the author is drawn from her own experiences and background as a British woman with both uh, Nigerian and Pakistani roots to explore these subjects in a way that lends it a sense of authenticity and sensitivity. This book is honestly one of the best books to come out of the murky publishing house and 10 out of 10 would recommend it. But yeah, that is all of my favourite books from this year. Oh, okay. No, like, that is my nine top 
nine top top nine favorite books from this year i had a really good reading year this year i'm really excited to read some more next year i really hope that you are all keeping safe uh, i hope that you're all having a wonderful holiday season uh, as we enter this beautiful new year 2022 what's good Let, let's see what you got to offer um but until then i really hope that you did like this video please tell me as usual what were some of your favorite books this year because that's genuinely how I pick books to read. I read quite a few books that people recommended to me last year and bought a few that I still have to read. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited to see what your guys' favourite books were. Um, yeah, I think that's it. I'm going to stop embarrassing myself now. I'm going to go and edit this 40 minute video that I filmed in 4K because I hate myself um, quite clearly. Um, and yeah, um, yeah, I'm going to, I'm just going to go. Yeah. Bye.